for counsel. This is a, comp a compulsory discipline case based on respondent's conviction for misapplication of fiduciary property between $20,000 and $100,000 in the 230th District Court of Harris County, Texas. The petition for compulsory discipline was filed with this board on March 4th of 2016. Respondent was served, excuse me, personally served with a petition by Nancy M. Aquinas, a process server on March 17th of 2016. And then respondent filed his answer on or about March 31st of 2016. Proof of service has been on file since April 13th of this year. On or about November 23rd of 2013, respondent was charged by indictment with misapplication of fiduciary property in cause number 1339959598, styled the State of Texas versus Leroy M. Daniels in the State of District Court of Harris County, Texas. On or about January 21st of 2015, an order of deferred was entered in the criminal case wherein respondent pled no low contendere to misapplication of fiduciary property, a third degree felony, and was placed on community supervision for a period of five years in order to pay $212 in court costs. We have exhibits, the petitioner's exhibits one through four. Exhibit one is a certified copy of the indictment in the underlying criminal case. Exhibit number two is a certified copy of the order of deferred adjudication entered in the criminal case. Exhibit number three is the original affidavit of myself attesting to the fact that the respondent is the same person as the person identified as the defendant in the criminal case. And exhibit four is the original certificate from Blake A. Hawthorne, the clerk of the Supreme Court of Texas, dated April 6th of 2016, which indicates that respondent is licensed and is authorized to practice law in Texas. And we have no objection to the admission of the certified governmental exhibits. Do you have objections to any of the other exhibits? Well, I have five that I, Mr. Chairman, I've got five that I'm going to offer, but we have no objection to the face of the exhibits that she has identified. Do you need to see them, Mr. Parris? I have already. She has been kind enough to send me a copy, and we had the conference before the hearing, and she served as a certification. So I'm convinced that they are official governmental records. I am, too. They will be admitted. May I approach? You may. The respondent filed a notice of appeal of his criminal convictions with the Court of Appeals for the 14th District of Texas in Houston on January 22nd of 2015. We are seeking an interlocutory order suspending Mr. Daniels' license to practice law during the pendency of the appeal. I think the Board will have noticed that in the respondent's answer, he has raised the Rule 602 in the Board's internal procedural rules as requesting this Board to use its discretion to not suspend him during the appeal. And so I'd like to address, I have five points on that issue, if I may go ahead and address those. Thank you. The first point, well, the points are, the five points have to do with why this Board, why BOTA today, should interpret the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure, the pertinent rule, and BOTA's internal operating rules, should read them in harmony. And it's the Commission's position that that's the only reasonable result in this case. So the first point is that the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure, and we've brought this under the Section 8 of those rules, is the primary source of authority for compulsory discipline in Texas. BOTA's internal operating rules, excuse me, procedural rules, should be interpreted to assist in implementation of Part 8 of the Rules of Disciplinary Procedure, rather than to contradict it. And we're talking about Rule 804 of the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure, which says that a respondent shall be suspended during the pendency of their criminal appeal. 602 of BOTA's internal procedural rules says that BOTA may suspend via interlocutory order during the appeal. So that's the interplay that we're talking about. My second point is that the Texas Supreme Court noted in the Ament case, and that is, the site is 890 Southwest 2nd 39, it's a 1994 case after BOTA was in existence, noted that the purpose to advance the 
advanced compulsory discipline is the protection of the public from attorneys who under, are under criminal censure. And Mr. Daniels is currently under criminal censure. So the only protection that we have for the public right now <coughs> is to have him suspended during the pendency of his appeal. The third point is that prior to this change in BOTA's internal procedural rules, which just went into effect in uh, uh, February 15th, prior to that, it was well settled that an attorney convicted of certain types of crimes, these compulsory cases, is, it should be suspended during the pendency of his criminal appeal. I point to two different cases. The Heard case, State Bar of Texas v. Heard, is a 1980 Supreme Court case. And that was a, uh, it was under a different statutory construction, but the substantive part of the statute at issue said the same thing, that the, that the lawyer shall be suspended during the pendency of his appeal. And the Supreme, uh, in that case, the district court, who heard compulsory cases at that time, denied the state bar's request for, for the interlocutory order suspending the, the attorney during the appeal. The state bar uh, <coughs> filed a, a writ of mandamus, and the Supreme Court held that the district court did not have discretion in this situation, that upon proof of the conviction, the court had a mandatory duty to suspend during the appeal. So that's the Heard case. And I also point your attention to the Mercier case. That's more recent, and that's since the uh, creation of BOTA. That's <coughs> 242 Southwest 3rd 46. Although the interpretation of Rule 804 was not the issue at play in Mercier, the court said in its opening line of the opinion, upon conviction of certain crimes, an attorney's license must be suspended pending appeal. They went on in the case and noted later on in the case, pending his criminal appeal, the Board of Disciplinary Sus Appeals suspended Mercier's license to practice law as required by Rule 804. My fourth point is that if, if the board interprets this rule as, as the respondent is, is requesting, this gives a respondent a whole new reason to pursue an appeal as long as possible, a respondent that is convicted and only given probation. Because we all know that, that BODA has the discretion to either suspend for the duration of that probation or disbar that lawyer, right? If the appeal lasts longer than the duration of that probation, it is effectively robs BODA of that later discretion that, that does not occur until the conviction is final. So what we're faced with is, in this case, we've got a five-year probation. If the attorney is not suspended during the pendency of the appeal, they essentially get to ride out that five years. If the appeal lasts six years, BOTA will only be able to disbar or retroactively suspend the attorney for that five years, which really helps no one because they were licensed to practice law during that time. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does that, that's it, it almost seems like to me that's a danger for the person who's convicted. At that point, Boda has no discretion. He may be more likely to be disbarred at that time. Well, I've, the commission submits that it's a danger to the public because Boda may that. not be inclined to disbar it given as Boda gets to look at addition, addition, additional factors when it's making the determination whether to disbar or suspend. You may believe that disbarment is not appropriate and the public and the bar has been robbed of the opportunity to have that person uh, be suspended for having been convicted of a crime in the state of Texas, well, a crime generally. My fifth point is that what the respondent's attempting to do here, I think the board has already seen the, the five exhibits that he's filed. It's two things. One is to collaterally attack the conviction. And we, we know that is completely inappropriate in this setting. The fifth exhibit is the brief that was filed with the 14th Court of Appeals attacking the judgment. This is not the place or time for that to happen. The second thing that these exhibits lead me to believe that the respondent is trying to do is to have a full-blown evidentiary hearing on the facts of the underlying criminal case. There is a provision for that. It's in 801, and it says that we can bring, bring suit based on the compulsory discipline based on the conviction itself, <coughs> and we could also bring a regular evidentiary case or a, a standard discipline case that goes through the full process. That's where an evidentiary hearing on the facts of the case is to occur. That's not where we are. 
Again, the commission is seeking an entry of an interlocutory order of suspension pending the outcome of Mr. Daniel's criminal appeal. I would ask that Boda make the determination on whether, on how to interpret these two rules and how they work together um, so that we might know whether these, these five exhibits are, are going to be useful in having an evidentiary hearing today on this issue. Any questions from anybody on the board? Yes, Ms. Stevens. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you for addressing that threshold question, which was brought up in, in the briefing. What's the date that the internal rule was promulgated? I think you mentioned it, but I didn't pick it up. It, they went into effect in February of 2015. And both the internal rules and the procedure rules were promulgated by the Supreme Court? That's correct. All right. Was there anything in the history of the promulgation in 2015 that spoke to this shall versus may question? You, you, do you mean like um, any documents back and forth between both and the Supreme Court? Not that I'm aware of. <clears throat> the second of your five reasons was to protect the public. What is the risk to the public that you see from the unusual facts of this case? Well, I. I think the, the general proposition that a lawyer who's been convicted of a crime right. is a danger to the public. That's, that is the general proposition. And that the compulsory discipline is set up in such a way that it protects the public in the meantime and in, during the pendency of an appeal. And so that, that was really the focus. That it's a general proposition. I have a follow-up. So in terms of a compulsory discipline, is it your position that we should not review the nature and circumstances of the underlying conviction? Well, I think that opportunity comes, albeit to a limited extent, when you're deciding whether to disbar or suspend after the appeal is, con is uh, excuse me, after the conviction is final. But if we look at, for example, the conviction of the trial transcripts and say, I don't think the lawyer might have been convicted, but we don't see the harm to the public. It's the it's it's your position that we have no discretion. I, I guess I need to know at what point in the process you're talking about. Are you talking about where we are right in here, or are you talking about later on when deciding when weighing whether to suspend for the duration of the probation versus disbarment? How about right now? <clears throat> it it is the commission's position that the board should interpret these rules uh, in harmony and and suspend during the pendency of an appeal. Regardless, Ms. Stevens, uh, just a couple of factual questions here. Is uh, Mr. Daniels suspended now? No, he's not. And was there any effort made by any uh, uh, to get any uh, s um, the suspension probated or whatever uh, from the evidentiary? Oh, we haven't had an evidentiary, so there wouldn't be any opportunity to that. And, and the final question is: Is it your position that the conviction? Uh, of a intentional or serious crime, as might be defined here, uh, uh, automatically presumes that there is harm to the public if there's continued practice. Right. That's exactly the proposition that uh, I was trying to articulate for Mr. Maketa. And is it your position that the burden of proving to the contrary would be on the lawyer? Well, if or does he have this? It definitely have is. At the stage where Boda is deciding whether to disbar or suspend, it absolutely is. There's a there's a case that I cannot right. uh, cite for you right now that says just that that we start at disbar. But you're saying we don't have that discretion right now. I'm or saying I am asking this board to interpret these rules in a way that they that you would suspend during during the appeal of an intentional conviction every time. That's so if Mr. Paris uh, was able to present to us evidence showing that there is no harm or danger, you would, your position would be that's irrelevant. We shouldn't consider that at this time. Well, that was part of my very end of my question was I would hope that the board would tell me whether they were going to interpret these rules in the way that I'm asking them to, and if not, then we can have this evidentiary hearing and, and I'll make any arguments as necessary. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, when, would you, when would you suggest such an evidentiary hearing take place? Well, it was, it's my understanding it would take place today if the board right. is inclined to. Okay, and, and then uh, I'll ask this question of you, Mr. Stevens, also Mr. Parrish. Uh, your and you can answer during your argument, uh, but practically, uh, when do we think the 14th is going to rule given submission February 18th? I don't know the answer to that. No. Well, do you have any idea on their schedule, on just how fast opinions are getting out? <clears throat> No, I don't, but I, I could ask our appellate counsel and get it. some yes. Mr. Parrish, you can do our satellite. 
Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Thank you. Mr. Paris? Yes. I, one more thing. I, I assume that the board is not going to decide right now whether to uh, accept my version of how this, these rules should be interpreted. So we're going to go ahead and have an evidentiary hearing? I, I wouldn't assume that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I always seem to come up here, well, I have a law question. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we do believe that uh, Mr. Daniels, my client, who is a criminal attorney who practices in Houston and who has a clean disciplinary record, uh, should have the opportunity to uh, explain uh, the nature of the facts involving the, this matter. We really don't deem it to be a situation where we're going behind, necessarily behind the face of the, of the uh, uh, judgment or the order of deferred adjudication. Uh, which was based on a plea, by the way, of NOLO, and which has a law question before it uh, involving whether or not, uh, or who was the owner of this property that was supposedly misappropriated by a fiduciary, and whether or not there was any fiduciary. That in, it, in and of itself is on the face of the indictment, it's on the face of the uh, order of deferred adjudication. The Discretion or the preliminary question. I thought perhaps I'd give it, get a chance to uh, make the presentation before I had to answer her her presentation first. However, uh, I can tell you that you know I'm I'm just as uh, 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 less knowledgeable about the impact of you know, the internal uh, procedural rules of BOTA that became effective on February the 19th, 2015, a little over a year ago. As was uh, as I was about the the, uh, the compulsory disciplinary rule and the Texas disciplinary rules of procedure, Texas rules of disciplinary procedure, which is uh, 8.04. I will tell you that that the rule 6.01a, <coughs> which is the interlocutory suspension rule, which is the preliminary question that we're here on today. We're not here on a question of 8.05 uh, and your discretion whether or not to suspend or disbar after the finality of the order of uh, deferred adjudication. We're here on a preliminary uh, uh, ruling uh, as to whether or not there should be an interlocutory suspension. And 6.02a is quite clear. It says in any compulsory proceeding under TRDP part 8 in the BOTA determines that the respondent has been convicted of intentional crime and that the crime <coughs> and that the crime of conviction is on appeal, BOTA may suspend the respondent's license. This is a rule promulgated by the Supreme Court also, and it's a rule that that modifies, explains uh, the 8.05, uh, or I'm sorry, the 8.04 procedural rule. Now, while it's true that the 8.04 procedural rule used the terms placed on probation for intentional crime with or without an adjudication of guilt, he shall be suspended uh, <clears throat> during, during any appeal, the content of that rule also became somewhat discretionary when it said the Board of Appeals shall sit here and determine whether the attorney shall be disciplined and enter judgment accordingly. Uh, so. There is a conflict even within 8.04. I she, maybe she has some cases that interpret 8.04 that, that do not allow discretion. We would state and present to the board that our position that 6.02a, which was promulgated most recently by the Supreme Court, would allow and gives the board discretion to at least observe the underlying facts or at least the facts in an as far as the explanation standpoint of the face of the documents that she has offered to determine whether or not there should be a interim suspension during the process of an appeal. These are legal questions that are before the 14th Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over those legal questions, and, and they were submitted in February to the 14th Court of Appeals in answer to your question, Ms. Johnson. I, I don't know how long that uh, 
that uh, opinion is going to take to come back to the Court of Appeals. It's been submitted since uh, February, and uh, I don't think it would be much longer given the context of the brief and given the context of the legal arguments that are made in the brief, uh, particularly since uh, Mr. Daniels voluntarily entered a plea of NOLO so he could get this legal question to the Court of Appeals. Let me ask you, it was a voluntary choice on Mr. Daniels' part not to go forward with the evidentiary issue in trial as to ownership and fiduciary status, but to test that only by quashal efforts. Uh, he had the right to contest it as an evidentiary matter at all, but instead pled the nullo contendere. Yeah. Have I understood that correctly? Uh, Mike, I, I'm sorry, Mr. McKenna, that's, that's, that's correct. We know each other from the past, but, but yes, that, that is correct. Uh, he filed some motions to quash on the legal issue, and those motions were over, overruled, and so uh, he voluntarily thought he could get the overruling of those motions to the Court of Appeals. But had the power, if he chose, to have an evidentiary adjudication whether he was a fiduciary and what was the status of the ownership. He had the option. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by both you and Ms. Stevens' argument on the interplay of these two, but let me ask a couple of predicate things, Mr. Paris. Sure. Is there any contest that this is an intentional crime? The face of the indictment would suggest that it is an intentional crime for misapplication of property by a fiduciary. And the Obviously, case we, from a legal standpoint, we contest that in the sense that we don't know how the 157th District Court, which was the Civil Court of Forfeiture, could have been, in fact, a, a fiduciary of, of, of Mr. Daniels, nor do we know, uh, or can under, or, and we can't understand, how he could misappropriate his own property. So, but, but the face of the indictment you mentioned, the face of the judgment of conviction also states an intentional crime under the definition, doesn't yes, it? Yes, I think it I think it has a, a, a recitation that it's an, a misapplication of fiduciary property. And I think that fits, I believe, the B portion, uh, the intentional crime definition, as I recall. So, uh, um, you know, while we're contesting the merits of the underlying uh, case from a legal standpoint in the 14th Court of Appeals, uh, I think the, the face of the order of deferred adjudication and the indictment make those statements. And uh, uh, what we would like, and we believe the board has discretion under 602A, which we believe is a modification uh, by the Supreme Court of 8.04, is to let Mr. Daniels uh, tell the board about his character, a little bit about the fact that his practice does not uh, affect uh, an injury to the general public, about the fact that um, he uh, uh, has an ongoing practice that uh, would not be injurious to his clients in addition to the general public. Uh, we think that that degree of discretion would enter under 6.02a and give him the opportunity for at least that explanation. We don't think it's a, it's a collateral attack on the judgment. Uh, for him to explain to this board that uh, at least uh, the underlying facts and the fact that his practice to, for his ongoing clients uh, doesn't constitute an injury to those clients and the general public. And, and we think that 6.02, the way it's been modified by the Supreme Court effective 2015, gives us that opportunity and gives you the opportunity and the option and the discretion, as you have later, uh, to, uh, under 8. I think 05 to either suspend or disbar, but it gives you the option at this preliminary stage to decide whether or not to suspend during the remainder of this appeal. And I know the, rem the appeal won't be final <coughs> until the mandate comes down. Um, and I, I will, I will uh, at least admit 
to counsel that just made the preceding argument that that mandate, of course, if the matter is subsequently appealed to the Supreme Court, could not come down for a little longer. But nevertheless, uh, I don't think that um, the argument that uh, there's danger to the general public just from the face of a order of deferred adjudication um, uh, comes about here as a matter of law uh, without some sort of explanation that now you have the discretion that you did not previously perhaps have to consider. Mr. Paris, if, if you were to put on evidence, would it be testimony from your client? It would be brief. It would uh, be an identification of the five exhibits that we su submitted. It would be um, a little testimony about uh, his character, his practice, um, <coughs> and his dealings with the general public. It would be a little, uh, a little testimony about uh, he having ever acted in a fiduciary matter out of this underlying case, and I must say it will touch on whether or not and whose property this in fact was, uh, this automobile in question. So your, your proof would be Mr. Daniel's testimony Correct. as you described. All right. Any, yes, any, Mr. Chairman. Anybody have any further questions for Mr. Paris? Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Mr. Chair, I suggest that we receive evidence subject to our determination whether it's relevant, that is, whether we have discretion or not under the conflict that the two counsel have identified. I, 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 that's what I was going to suggest. Um, um, and Ms. Stevens, do you have any witnesses? No, I do not. Do you have any exhibits that you would offer on this issue? I do. Okay. Um, we have... Um, and, and from a time standpoint, Mr. Chairman, I don't think my presentation would take more than... 30 minutes, maybe 20. Um, Do they have agreement on the exhibits, <laughs> both sides? Well, we, we've submitted them. She objects on the grounds of relevancy. I believe that she's already made that kind of apparent in her argument. So uh, that's where we are. I mean, I guess they could be. What about yours to hers? Uh, I, I didn't have any objection to her governmental exhibits. They've been admitted, I understand. Yes, they, they were admitted. But I have additional right. exhibits. I'll, I'd have to see those. Well, um, in the interest, I'm trying to figure out how to handle this in the interest of time because we have two other matters um, that we need to take up. Um, but I hate to take a break and, and start over again. So I, I think what we will do, um, I, I, my learned colleague probably has the correct suggestion as he usually does. So. Uh, why don't we proceed, um, but uh, uh, with... If we need to adjourn to have you hear something else, I mean, I guess we could do that. I mean, Well, let's, let's see how call. quickly we can, we can do this. Um, um, my concern is, and, and I do not, I don't think any of us believe that getting into the underlying case with, in effect, a collateral attack saying he's not guilty is, is within our province. Uh, so I would like to try and avoid that at all. With the exception, Mr. Chairman, of a couple of questions, I don't intend to go any further. Okay. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and do that as quickly as we can. We have other matters that we need to take up and uh, and see how quickly we can get this done. So, All you right. want to put Mr. Daniels on? Yes. Call Mr. Daniels. Uh, mm -hmm. Parish, you may proceed. Thank you. State your name for the board, please, sir. Yes, it's Leroy McKelly Daniels. And Mr. Daniels, are you a licensed attorney in the state of Texas? Yes, sir. How long have you been licensed? December 1988, 28 years. And do you have any disciplinary past uh, record? Um, I believe in 2004, I was placed on three years probation. And what was that for? Um, Going into that case, I had a PI, at that time I was doing PI work, personal injury, 
and I had a client who was, whose sister that she was in an accident and she couldn't care for herself. So when we settled her case, I wound up giving some of her settlement to her sister to help make her home home handicap accessible. And her sister never told her. Uh, when she found out about it, she filed a complaint saying that I kept her money, uh, which was I think around $25,000. So I was put on three years probation, ordered to pay her her money back. Um, Did you successfully uh, uh, complete that probationary period? Yes, sir. It was from 2004 to 2007. Without any incident? No, sir. And have you had any disciplinary uh, history or uh, discipline since that time? No, sir. And what is the nature of your practice, sir? Um, about 85 to 90 percent criminal defense. Okay. And has that been the case for how long? Since we stopped doing personal injuries since 2002, 2003. So you're not involved with the type of practice anymore that led to the prior discipline, correct? No, sir. Okay. Now, uh, how many clients do you presently have? A small firm total. <coughs> Maybe 40. All right. And are all, to your knowledge, are all those clients presently satisfied with your performance on their cases? Yes, sir. Have you ever had any complaints from the general public other than the disciplinary history that you've told the ladies and gentlemen of the board about in, in connection with, with your practice? Um, I believe two years ago, um, my, at that time, he was a, associate um, brother was charged with kidnapping, um, aggravated robbery, and we represented him, worked out a plea agreement. After it was over with, he filed a complaint saying that um, I let his brother, who had just passed the bar, sit in on the case and do his plea. Um, and I believe the um, state bar said that was no complaint. So they toss that out. <coughs> any other matter that uh, would affect, uh, or is there any matter that you know of that would affect your present clients if this board saw fit to let you continue to practice the law until the appeal of this underlying case is completed? No, sir, if I understand your, your question. There's, there's nothing pending or no one has complained or anything else concerning my practice. Can you tell me, I noticed that you, one of the documents that has been put in as an exhibit is the order of deferred adjudication. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But I noticed that uh, on the face of it, it says that uh, you, in fact, uh, pled no contender. Yes, sir. Can you explain to the members of the board why you pled no low contend rate rather than, as Mr. McKetty indicated, using the option of going forward with a trial? Yes, sir. Can you uh, explain that? Yes, sir. When I was first indicted on this, my classmate, Byron Watson, I called him. He came. He, I guess, did the bond to get me out, and he represented me all the way through. Um, I trusted Byron. We had always planned for this to go to trial. We was going to fight it to the end. We set it after three motions. We set it for trial. Um, and on the day of trial, Byron sort of, he was afraid. He had gotten shell shot. The year before, he tried a case of his cousin and lost, and his cousin got 25 years. So, he basically in the room said, I can't do it. I can't, I can't be the one that if we lose, wind up you losing your license and end up going to jail. Your Honor, I'll object to the hearsay. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, let me, let me I think he's getting into some attorney client issues too. So let me I'm rephrase the question here. Uh, rather than talking about what your lawyer told you, what you told your lawyer, uh, had you uh, filed some preliminary motions raising this legal issue around this indictment? Yes, sir. We filed three different motions um, alleging that the car could not have been misappropriated because I, in fact, owned it way before they filed the actions. 
we filed a motion stating that the value of the car was not what they said it was and that the bond, there was no substantial risk of loss because the bond that we filed and was ordered to pay covered any substantial risk of loss, which was all legal questions. And also the last thing, our motion was the court didn't have jurisdiction because the 157th could not own the property. The only owner of the property was me. And the 157th court is the civil court where the forfeiture action was filed? Yes, sir. And now Brother Wood. You may. We've submitted exhibit number one. Tell me what exhibit number one is, fast. This is the contract that I have with my client, Angel Rodriguez, to represent him and his friends. And in the contract it states that he's given me the 2,000 Mercedes S500 as part of his fees. Did you take possession of that car as part of the case? Yes, sir. Exhibit number two, real quickly, what is that? This is the title registration where I took the title from Mr. Rodriguez when he transferred the name on the car from his name to my name. This is the same automobile car that's talked about on the face of the indictment on the exhibits that have been entered, correct? Yes, sir. Exhibit number three, please, sir. This is the order from the 157 giving Mr. Rodriguez the ability to basically get the property, get the car back from the state who had seized it. And it says alleged? Yeah, it says that Angel Rodriguez is the alleged owner or interest holder in the said property. All right, sir. Exhibit number three also has a check attached. Can you tell me what that is? That's the $25,300 that we were ordered to pay since the car was transferred from the court. And that's on the surety? Yes, sir. Okay. My firm was the surety on the bond, so. They were co-surety? Well, they were the original surety. I was the co-surety. Okay. Exhibit number four is from the 14th Court of Appeals. Can you tell me what that is? Yes. This is the clerk's docket sheet stating that we've already filed our brief. The state has filed their brief. It has been submitted to the court, and they're determining whether our questions of law, which way it would decide. And exhibit number five is the brief that has presently been filed in the Court of Appeals that's been submitted, correct? Yes, that's the brief that was filed by Ms. Heather Lytle in our case stating that the questions of law that the court overruled should have been granted. And these are all exhibits that pertain to or reflect on the allegations of the indictment and the order of deferred adjudication that have been entered into evidence that the prosecutor submitted. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, do I basically understand your position, legal position, as you sit here today, that in fact you cannot misappropriate fiduciary property that you own? I have to object. This is exactly what I was talking about. This is a collateral. Yeah, I agree with that, Mr. Parrish. Let's keep it to what we've talked about. Sustain. Daniel, based on your appeal, based upon your appeal, the legal questions that you have raised, is it your position that you're asking the board in its discretion to let the Court of Appeals decide this legal position before taking any further action, and specifically with regard to taking any preliminary action of suspending your license pending the finality of this appeal by mandate? Yes, sir. I pass the witness. Ms. Stevens, do you have any questions? I'm trying to decide that right now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Parrish, do you want to offer those in evidence? I will, and I was going to wait until the end of her question. But we'll offer exhibits number one through five. And the petitioner does have objections to each of them. Exhibit one is the contract identified by a respondent. We object to the hearsay. This was not, as far as I'm aware, brought to the attention of the trial court, so the relevance here is questionable. 
that I think it's been authenticated. So those are the two on Exhibit 1. The same objections for Exhibit 2 as to hearsay. And again, relevance as it was not brought to the trial court's attention. Exhibit 3, it's unclear to me whether this was brought to the trial court's attention. It is a certified record, so there's no hearsay objection there. But I'll object to relevance on 3 as well as 4 and 5. 4 and 5 are definitely an attempt to collaterally attack the judgment. 5 is the brief on appeal to the court of the 14th Court of Appeals. All right. Any other objections? We'll allow them, but understand we're not, I don't think anybody on the board wants to render a judgment in the underlying matter, so we're not going to be looking at it for that purpose. But for the purposes that I understand you've offered it, Mr. Ferris. The limited purpose of consideration of the board on his ability to presently represent clients and protect his clients and the general public. And so those would be the limited purpose these are offered. And that's subject, of course, to your ruling as to whether or not you have discretion even to consider it. They'll be admitted with that stipulation. Thank you. I do have a few questions. Go ahead. You want these? Actually, I think right here. Yeah, Mr. Ferris, give them to. Oh, okay. I was going to give them to the court reporter. You may. Good morning, Mr. Daniels. Good morning. I just want to go over the disciplinary history that you talked about. You identified a judgment of probated suspension from 2004. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that suspension lasted for three, excuse me, probated suspension lasted for three years. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? And there were, in fact, nine different rule violations found in that judgment. Is that correct? I don't remember, but if it's there, I believe so. Okay. May I approach the witness? You may. Mr. Daniels, I'm showing you the final judgment of suspension that you referenced with your attorney. And if you'll just flip to the second page. And the rule violations are actually in bolded. If you would count those for me, I'd appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. One, two. Nine different ones? Yes. Okay. And to your recollection, Mr. Daniels, the rule violations that were involved had to do with communication with the client. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. A contingency fee not being put in writing. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Holding the money that belonged to a third party in violation of the disciplinary rules. Is that right? Yes. Three different rules on that issue. Yes, ma'am. And then failure to supervise non-lawyer assistants. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Daniels, you talked about with your lawyer, you talked about this judgment and you talked about a subsequent grievance that was filed against you that was dismissed by the bar, right? Yes. Okay. But he asked you a question about whether you had any other disciplinary history, and I think your answer was no. Is that correct? No, I think he asked did I have any other history since then. Okay. But you do, in fact, have disciplinary history from prior to the 2004 judgment that you identified, correct? I believe it was two. Two others? I believe so. Okay. Well, let me see if I can. May I approach the witness? May. Good morning. Mr. Daniels, I'm going to show you four different documents and see if we can establish how many prior disciplinary judgments you've got. Do you remember that you have a prior disciplinary judgment of a ... Another fully probated suspension, and this judgment is dated 1995. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
I apologize. Yes. So you've got a, a, another fully probated suspension from 1995, correct? Yes. And how many rule violations were found in that, in that judgment? Four. Five, isn't it? Five. And then prior to that, we've got <coughs> a three judgment of public reprimand. Is that right? Judgment of private reprimand, correct? Yes. And what's the date of that? 1983. And your license in 1988? 1988. Okay. And then, okay, yes. And the last one is a, an additional agreed judgment of private reprimand, correct? Yes. And what's the date on that? 1983. Is it the same one? <coughs> Six different, uh, excuse me, five disciplinary judgments uh, prior to your conviction in the underlying criminal case that we hear, hear about today. Is that right? Yes. Cross the witness. Ms. Daniels, uh, is the most recent fiscal that you had the judgment of 2003? Yes. So that's been 13 years ago. Yes, and uh, I, I believe the ones that she referenced were in 93, two of them were private reprimands. Um, one was a public reprimand, and the other one was a 60-day probated sentence. So for the last 13 years, it's been no disciplinary matters. No, sir. That you have submitted to either an agreement on or been found to have violated, correct? Yes, sir. And in the last 13 <coughs> years, I believe you stated that your, the nature of your practice had changed? Yes, from personal injury to criminal. Uh, are most of these uh, that predate 2003 based on personal injury matters? Um, I believe so. The first one, <coughs> if I remember looking at it correctly, it was from a client who paid us with a bogus check, the check that was NSF, uh, never made it, came back to, although we called him and said, come pay us the money, he never did. So we filed a motion with the court and didn't show up. And the court gave me a private rep reprimand because I alleged to the court we didn't have an attorney-client privilege because I didn't have any money. And they said my interpretation was wrong, so they gave me a private reprimand. But focusing on the period of time since 2003, there have been, there have been no discipline. In no, other sir. words, you've cleaned up your practice substantially. Yes, sir. And your practice is now primarily criminal law. Yes, sir. How many, how many clients did you say you'd rather represent? I believe it's around 40. 40? Yes, sir. And uh, during the period of time that you believe this, this appeal will, will take before the, the, a mandate comes back on a decision, uh, any one of those, uh, any number of those 40 clients, do you think that uh, would, would have any problems with your continued representation in your, in your opinion? No, sir. Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. No, sir. That's all I have. We have any questions to anybody on the board? Go ahead, Mr. Gonzalez. Go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. Do you have a copy of the exhibits in front of you? No, sir, but I can get them. Could you please? I have a couple questions. So one's that been please. I wanted to start with the contract. Sir, here you go. You can take my copy. Mr. Ferris, I gave you my copy. 
If you can walk me through a few things, because I just want to make sure that I've got my dates right. So the agreement, I'm looking at exhibit number one. Agreement between you and Angel Rodriguez and Olga Joffrey is on September 29, 2006. Yes, sir. The non-refundable fee is $2,500, correct? The legal fees are $25,000. Yes, sir. And the transfer of the 2,000 Mercedes-Benz, which is valued at $23,000, is, I guess, going to, the title is going to be transferred to you that same day? Well, he, he, I think he presented the title maybe a week or two later, and we held it in our safe. Okay. So then, when you say we held it in our savings, so where actually was the vehicle? Were you driving it? No, sir. Not at that time. Okay. At what, let's go to the, to exhibit two, because in exhibit two, we see a receipt on November 8, 2006. Yes, sir. Okay. So at that point, do you own the 2000 Mercedes? I believe that was the transfer, yes, sir. We had transferred it. So when, when your attorney talked earlier about this is my property that I own, is it your contention that you had owned that car as of November 2006? Well, that's the day that we transferred the title. I actually owned the car when he signed the contract and gave me the title. Okay. So if you owned the car at that point, you had to hold it in trust because that was still an unearned fee, correct? Well, I guess that's why we kept the, the title in the safe. You hadn't done $23,000 of work yet in that month between September and November, or two months, had you? We had done, in reference to that case, Mr. Gonzalez, we had done a substantial, a substantial amount of work because Mr. Vizcano, Mr. Rodriguez were all charged with multiple counts of aggravated robberies and impersonating police officers. So we had filed motions for bonds, bond reductions. We had gone through different interviews with different police officers, had filed motions, I believe, to suppress identification because a lot of the stuff, it was, I believe, five different gentlemen, and some of the identifications were sketchy. So between September, excuse me, late September and November, we were in court probably three, about three days a week on different ones that Mr. Rodriguez had had us represent. Is there a billings under your provision of your contract in Exhibit 1? It says that you'll provide monthly billing statements so the clients would then know how much has been worked. Is there any, was there any monthly billing statement provided to the clients? No, sir. We just operated on a flat fee. So, well, a flat fee, but at what point do you then consider that you've earned the amount of money that the car we valued at? I think when we transferred the title, we figured we had earned that amount because we also billed him for additional fees. Well, if we can go to Exhibit 3, which is the order on the motion for Replevy bond, this is where I get confused because in the order it recites that, it appears to me that it recites that Angel Rodriguez is the interest holder and the owner. So, are you filing with the court and is the court of the opinion that as of March 19, 2007, that you don't own the car, but is the representation made that Angel still owns the car? If I remember back during that time, we had filed an answer saying that we owned the car. We had a hearing on it. The court ruled the state had filed a motion to strike. We took that up to the 14th because the court said that although we were an interest holder at the time that they had filed the action, the state alleged that we didn't own it. We had chosen that we did own it. The 14th sent it back to the court saying it couldn't decide that provision until the case was over with. I believe that was in late February and that's when we asked the court to reconsider the order. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Your case is under submission.
court to release the car because it had been sitting up for six months and it was starting to dry rot and everything else and protect the value of the car. We asked them to release it. So when they issued an order, they said because the action, the forfeiture action was brought in Angel Rodriguez's name, they could only release it to him. That's why when we drafted the order and it was an agreed order, we put him as the alleged owner or interpreter of the car because the forfeiture action was actually brought in his name and not in our name. Was this a forfeiture action for the concern that the car was from drug proceeds or from illegal proceeds or contraband? Well, and that was one of the arguments in the criminal side that they were saying that this car was used in some of the alleged robberies when it turned out it was a BMW, a late model BMW that looked like this car. So at some point then, if that was the case, there never would have been a need to forfeit the car because then there was no evidence to be able to say this car should have been seized? Correct. And on the criminal side, that's what our argument. On the civil side, it never went back and forth because civil, I mean, forfeiture is a civil action. The actual determination of whether the car was used in the robberies or not was on the criminal side. Okay. So as far as the civil proceeding, at what point is the car or the bond actually due? The car is to be brought back to the court on the day of trial because the criminal trial was taking so long. The civil trial didn't happen until, I believe, sometime in June 2010. Okay. So was the car brought back in 2010? No, sir. And was the bond paid in full on that date in 2010? No. What happened was when we did present the car on June 2010, the state alleged that the bond should be forfeited. So we went to a hearing and the court agreed with them and ordered us to pay $23,100 plus attorney fees, so it came up to $25,300. In 2010? Yes, sir. Okay. And so was that paid in 2010? No, sir. Why not? One, we didn't have the money. And two, they never sent a demand, even though they had an order for it to be paid, they never sent a demand saying, hey, we want it to be paid. They filed an abstract on our property. Thank you. Those are the questions I had. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Let me – where did the car end up titled? The car was titled in Texas. No, no. In whose name was it on there? The car was titled in my name. So that's where it ended up is today? I'm sorry? I mean, is that where it ended up as a result of the proceedings you did when you paid on the bond? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Who did the title of the car's name end up in? It was titled in my name, sir. And it always stayed that way until you got rid of it? Yes. You got rid of it in 2008? I got rid of it in 2000. Yes, sir. And your wife traded that in for some other car? No, sir. I traded it in. And it was licensed in Florida then? Well, it was licensed in Texas, then it was licensed in Florida. And then we traded it in in 2008 because of problems with the car. Mr. Daniels, in 2007, in the Raplevin proceeding, you co-signed an instrument that said that your client, the respondent, was charged with ensuring that the car would be returned on a particular day. Yes, sir. When you did that, what steps did you take to make sure there would be no conflict between you and your client and your client would be able to return the car on the necessary date? If I understand your question, my client, when he was arrested, I believe, in November 2006, he never – he was never released? No. Okay. So I had the car. When I would visit with him and talk with him about the car, he said, the car is not mine, it's yours. I said, I understand that, but I need you to sign these documents, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. He said, whatever you do, that car is yours no matter what they say. And I communicated this with the state from day one, that my client has no interest in the car, he doesn't want the car, he gave the car to me, I gave you a copy of the contract and everything else. So as far as 
I was understood, as far as I understood, as far as what my client was informing me of, he had no interest in the car. I'm looking there, but I'm looking at a document. It's with Defendant's Exhibit 3, and then it's the fourth page, and it's called Surety Bond. And it's signed by your client, I think, about the middle of the page on the right. Can you find that? Yes. And it's got a certification that you were representing your client at the time, and you also signed it as well as perhaps a partner of yours or somebody from your law firm. Yes. And the instrument that your client signs says that he is charged with ensuring that the car shall be returned on the date of the hearing that would be a later date. Yes. So you had your client sign a document. Did you believe your client did or did not have the capacity to perform what he was charged with doing in this document? Yes, I did. And so what steps did you do to make sure that he would be able to return the car as he was charged with doing upon the final hearing date? When we picked up the car, Mr. – is it McKenna? It is. Okay. When we picked up the car, the car was in a state of disrepair because it had been sitting up for six months. So we spent, I guess, around, if I remember, almost $3,000. First thing we had to do was get the car jumped and towed off the lot because the tires were flat and the battery was dead. Then we had to go about replacing everything that was wrong with it from sitting up and being dry rotted for that long. So we continually for the next year before we finally decided it was too expensive to keep trying to maintain, we spent money trying to get the car back into correct operable condition. Once we determined, and I spoke with my client on almost every other month basis, when I told him, man, this car you gave me is costing more money than it was really worth, he said, it's your car, you can do with it whatever you want to. So at that time, we decided it's probably better if we trade the car in for something that's worth more and not costing us a bunch of money. And that was the only reason why, because it seemed as every month we're spending $1,500 trying to repair this car and keep it up. I think we're running out of time here, and I know Mr. Taylor has a question, so I want to give him a shot, and we're going to have to bring this to a conclusion fairly quickly here. So, Mr. Taylor. Well, this is kind of more of the same, but the abstract of judgment, the state canceled it and then refiled it after they indicted you. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, and then this check that's in here is for $25,300 to the state from you. Was that for your payment for the replevy bond? Yes, the judge ordered us to, when the judge ordered the bond forfeited, he ordered that we pay the value of the car plus, I guess, interest or whatever it was, attorney fees, and we paid the $25,400. So you did that? You paid it? They cashed the check? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all I have. All right. Unless there's any other short questions, you may step down. Oh, may I ask one more question? I apologize. You may. Make it brief. Thank you. Mr. Daniels, have you ever been convicted of, besides this crime, any other crimes? 1997, I was convicted of attempting to not file all of my taxes. I'm sorry, what did you say? Not filing all of my taxes. 1997. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Perry. You may step down. I think that, thank you very much. That will conclude this. We will take the matter under advisement and advise you of our ruling. Yes, Ms. Stevens. I'd actually like to offer three of the five judgments that Mr. Daniels and I spoke about, all the public ones. No objection. Thank you. They'll be admitted. You may. That's exhibit five, six, and seven. Thank you.